went into fall like that. None of that nice, warm, 70-degree, bee-filled Indian summer. I mean, boom, it's cold out there. And, and, you know, that's how life is. Life changes not on our calendar, amen? I mean, we, we really don't have the control to say when it's going to be daylight and when it's going to be dark and, and when we're going to have all the blessings in the world and when we're, there's going to be pain and suffering. That was the psalm this morning. Uh, the Israelites were, were imprisoned, had been overwhelmed, were being persecuted. And, Paul, and, and David's soul was grieving for the homeland. Grieving for a, a time in which they came together and were a, a, a community again. Um, but in October, um, growing up on the farm, this was our season of harvest. Um, you kind of prayed for a dry October so that you could get the corn out of the fields and the beans off the fields because um, you didn't want, you know, moisture was our enemy during the harvest because it could create mildew in the crops. And if the crops were wet and the moisture content was high, it wasn't good for a lot of things. Or else you had to put it in a dryer and that cut into the profit margin. It was also a season of, uh, of jubilee in the church because the church celebrated the harvest, the, the harvest of the foods that could be stored up to, to, to carry them through the cold months and, and, and the off-growing season. And so I think uh, for God's children, for us as God's church, um, fall is a season to perform a health check. I don't know how it came on my personal schedule, but um, September for me is always the time of year I have to go to the doctor and have my physical. So it, I, I get a health check whether I want it or not because they schedule me around the first week of September to come in and give blood and everything else and find out if I'm living right or not. But I think that's a, that's a good, um, good, good uh, practice to put into our faith walk too is, is our wellness check. How is it, as John Wesley would say, with your soul today? How, how are you in your relationship with God? And, and try to remember and, and be zeroed in on the, on the fact, um, the crosshairs of faith, um, that God is with us always, even and especially in our dark and sad times. It is then He carries us. He sustains us and He brings us back into the light. For He Himself said, You are never alone and you are always equipped by My Spirit which I give to you this day. So the, the Bible lessons this morning are about that, about um, sustaining the storm and being um, ready for whatever the world throws our way. We're going to begin in the book of Luke chapter 17, which... Um, um, Luke reminds us about uh, building the cornerstones of faith um, sturdy uh, to withstand the storms, the hurricanes in life. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, There will always be temptations to sin, but oh, what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. For it would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourself. In other words, he's saying, be ready. Be alert. <clears throat> Darkness is thriving in the world. If another believer sins, Jesus says, rebuke that person. But then, if there is repentance in their heart, forgive them. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, each time and turns to God and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. Man, how good at that are we, amen? Not so well. Yes. So what, what Jesus is saying, if their heart turns to me and repents of their sin, because we can only repent to Jesus. You know, He's the one that saved our soul. It was nothing but His blood that, that paved the way of our salvation. We, God's children, must forgive that person. How many times? Seven times 70. 
um, which if any of you are mathematicians, that's a whole lot of numbers. I'm sure that's not what he was talking about. He just said, if their heart is right, forgive them. And the apostles then said to the Lord, well, then show us how to increase our faith, Lord. Kids, the ones that are left. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, this tree here, he said, may you be uprooted and planted by the sea, and it would obey you. For when a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in, sit down, and eat with me? No. The master might say, "Be prepare me a meal, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat. And then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he is told to do? Well, no, of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. Now, <clears throat> Thankfully, over time, we've learned to be more gracious. Amen? If something, someone does something nice for us, we thank them. Or we're, we try to. That's, that's the way my mom and dad raised me. Be thankful for anyone who's kind to you. Right, Nancy? Praise the Lord for them. But when, when thinking about our relationship with, with Christ, remember that He is God in the flesh. The living, breathing Creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. And He is the Holy One. So we approach Him with humility. We approach Him with the aspect in our mind, in our hearts, in our souls of honoring Him with everything we do. What He's telling us not to do is is that when we do something as Christians to honor God, don't puff your chest out. Don't put a ribbon around your neck and say, look what I did. Be humble and be thankful that you have the blessing and the ability to do unto others. Jesus has given us everything we need to succeed, and we constantly ask, have to ask ourselves as we do our health check, are we using the blessings that He's given us? Beware, He says, of being the tempter and seek Jesus in all circumstances. You know, when I think of that, you know, if I'm performing a, a health check, part of that analysis is, am I ever a tempter? Do I never, do I ever... Maybe mistakenly lead someone in a wrong direction or, or grieve their soul. I mean, I think that's a healthy attitude to look at everything we do in that capacity. Am I glorifying God? Am I humble and patient servant of the Lord? Servant of the Lord. And do all of my actions glorify Him versus lead others astray? Repentance, remember this, repentance is an essential factor in faith building. Forgiveness and walking in the light. You know, my favorite analogy is the crosshairs. Keep the crosshairs of Christ's love centered in our vision. You know, like blinders on a horse. So that we aren't <laughs> tempted to go astray. Jesus is the light of the world. He will illuminate our path. Trust in Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And don't rely on our own understanding. That's the most important part. <laughs> no, we're not smart enough to get it all. And remember, number five. We must forgive to be forgiven. I always think of it this way. Forgive and let God. God can handle the soul of of anyone who's faking it. But I am to be the humble and gracious servant of God and shine His light unto the world. That's why I was talking about World Communion Day. It's our opportunity to take the, the sacrament of Holy Communion to the edges of the earth. We may not be there in person, but we're empowering someone to represent God's love through Jesus Christ in the body and blood of Christ that cleanses and restores our soul. How better to shine the light 
forward. Amen? Don't get caught up in the little thing. God has got this. Don't overthink of it. Overthink it. So let's continue now in faith building with this lesson in 2 Timothy. Remember, Timothy it was, was Paul's protege. Paul knew, Paul's in prison when he's writing this letter to Timothy. He's not having a great time. Um, he's cold, he's aging, and he knows soon he will see his Jesus. He will cross the bridge of light into eternity. And, but he wants to make sure that Timothy has everything he needs, and he wants to make sure that Timothy is equipped and empowered to continue spreading the good news. The good news is, kids, Jesus. It's that simple. The good news is Jesus. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Jesus has risen from the dead and is alive, and Jesus is coming back to take us home with Him again. Amen? Hallelujah. Right. So let's go to 2 Timothy now in chapter 1. And I like, all, you know, I'm a Paul fan. This letter is from Paul. Chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Jesus Christ. He being God the Father. Now remember who Paul was. A long time ago, he hated Jesus. He didn't fit his perception of who the Messiah should be. And if you like Jesus and Paul was Saul, you were in a world of hurt. Amen? But God met him. God spoke to him. His spirit shone, adown, shone down upon him. And Paul, Saul became Paul. It's always that crisscross. The most prolific writer in the New Testament. Because of that experience with Jesus. Because of that simple moment in which God said, Hey, what are you doing? You missed the boat. This man, Jesus, my son, your Savior, you're persecuting. Just like that. Just like that. Click your fingers. Yeah. I used to be able to do that a lot better. I don't know what happened. But that's how fast if God wants something to change, as small as a mustard seed. It can happen. And we've got to be ready and alert to do whatever is necessary. So Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, seeks to fulfill God's Word by telling the world about who? Jesus, the way, the truth, and life. Offering us grace, mercy, and peace through the one and the only Jesus Christ. Pretty clear and concise directions. Amen? We covered that last week's sermon, remember? The Word is God's clear and, correct and concise directions to our salvation. So Timothy... Every night I thank God for you, Paul writes. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Day and night I constantly remember you in prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. For I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you, Timothy. This is why I remind you to fan into, the, into flames the spiritual gifts that God has given you when I laid my hands upon you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about the Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I am in prison for Him right now. <laughs> A dark time, amen? Just like the psalm we read to start today. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us into a, to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was His plan from before the beginning of time to show us His grace 
through His one and only Son, Christ Jesus. And now He has made all of us this plain, all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way of life and immortality through the good news of He has risen. Amen. And God chose us to be preachers and apostles and teachers of this good news. This is why I'm suffering here in prison, but I'm not ashamed of it. For I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able, he is able, amen, to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Hold on to the pattern of whole, wholesome teaching that you have learned from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love you have in Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted in you. Clear and concise directions, amen, on the life of a church, the life of a follower. It's the work of all believers to do whatever it takes that the good news of Christ, the, the, the promise and the truth that He has risen goes to the ends of the earth <coughs> to everyone. And it begins with praise and adoration for all the blessings of all believers. You know, I, I get stoked on a Sunday when my joy column outnumbers my concern column, and it did this day. So it's your fault. I'm long-winded, and I'm super excited. Um, but stand on the promises. When it's dark, when it's storming, when we're beat down, and when nothing seems right, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Seek His Word in all you do. Amen? Rejoice in the Lord and consider it an honor to suffer for His name's sake. Because that's when the world's watching us. That's when the world's watching us. It's easy to be a happy Christian when everything's going well. Amen? But what do we, how do we act and what do we look like when the storm comes? When, when, when life isn't perfect, when we lose the ones so close to our heart, do we rise up and do we praise God for His sustaining power? Or do we crumble and fall? Allow the world to see your suffering in the name of Jesus. That, that speaks to me and my mom and dad. I have the best parents in the world. I, I bet most of you did too. And um, they just never talked about bad things. You know, my, my dad was a World War II veteran. My mom lost two brothers in World War II. My uncle and my dad, my dad's brother was a prisoner of war in Germany. And that forever changed his life. But they always talked about the blessing of knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That He would sustain us and guide us through the storm. And their mustard seed faith was all they needed to take the next storm. They were children of the Depression. They saw how bad it can get in a world that has fallen, that puts all of its hope in the wrong things. Yet they saw the world rise out. We are saved by the love of God, restored by the blood of Jesus, and equipped by His Spirit. So let's roll. Let's do whatever it takes to send forth to the world the good news that Jesus is alive. Guard your faith. Know that we're going to be attacked. Know that the enemy's only chance is to steal our voice. Because he knows Jesus is coming back. He knows the tomb was empty. He knows Christ rose from the dead. And he knows by the promise of the Lord through his word and the presence of the Holy Spirit that Christ is coming again and his days are numbered. Amen. And hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. 
And remember, stand on the promises. Shout it from the mountaintop. Jesus is coming, church. Jesus is coming, world. Are you ready? Have, have, has your, is your health checked? Did you get your physical? Is there anything we got to fix in our life to make sure we're ready for His return? For He alone is my rock. He alone is my Redeemer. He alone is the Savior of my soul. Amen? That's the good news. Christ is alive and He's in each and every one of us. <clears throat> we have the glorious blessing of telling babies about Him. We have the glorious blessing of loving babies and teaching them all the wonderful things in life when they follow Jesus. Amen? When they put their hope in Him. And no matter where we go in our walk of faith, trust in the Lord, stand on His promises, kneel in His presence, and humble yourself. And say, I need You, Lord. You are my God, my rock, and my Redeemer. All of this was God's plan from the beginning. To show His people the way. To give His people the instruments necessary. So even if their faith was, faith was only as big as a mustard seed, they could do all things through Christ their Lord who strengthens us. Think about that. We were at a scavenger hunt last night. I haven't done one of those in a long time. And one of the girls that that cooks with Jenny at the school, likes hot sauce. She got a whole wall, like 12 feet in her house of every kind of hot sauce made in the world. And like when we go on vacation, we always try to find her the next best thing. And have you seen that crazy challenge called the one chip challenge? Okay, talk about stupidity, right? They make this Dorito so hot that you can't taste anything and your mouth's on fire. And they put it in a little box and say, if you eat this and live, you can wear this neat little metal around your neck. Now, how stupid is that? Let me put this ghost pepper and reaper, Carolina reaper in my mouth and slobber like a rabid dog and have to drink a gallon of milk, milk so I can swallow, so I can have a little certificate that says I ate a hot pepper. No, I want a certificate that says Jesus loves me. His blood washed me as white as snow. And I am saved and redeemed in that blood. And I am given the grace and authority to share the good news with whomever God puts in my path. That's the medal we want around our neck. That's the thing we want to know when Jesus returns and he says, Hey, see that sheep pen? I got a spot for you. Yes! We have to be ready to do whatever. And don't let the world convince you that a Dorito is better than anything else. If I want to eat a Dorito, I don't want to burn my mouth. I mean, I want a little hamburger on it and cheese and pico de gallo with some sour cream. Yeah, I want a whole plate of that. Yeah, but not one that burns my mouth. I mean, I like hot stuff. But I know there's certain stuff I shouldn't eat, amen? We've learned, haven't we? I mean, when, when we go through the dark season, church, it's, it, it, it's not punishment. It's to teach us how to survive. In the short term, the devil is still with us. But in the long term, just as we sang today, we cross a bridge. We cross a bridge into paradise, to that place that Christ has prepared about. And we have to make sure Others are ready to go too. Others can see the change and the transformation in our life. And, and others know they don't have to eat a Dorito that burns their mouth. But just surrender their heart to the one who loves them and died for them and rose again. So as we conclude our worship this morning, I want to invite us to the table. I want us to remember um, Christ's offering uh, during His final Passover. 
in which he took a loaf of bread, um, this simple, And he said to his disciples and those gathered in the upper room, this is my body given for you. Take it and eat in remembrance for me. Remember, they had never heard that before. I mean, what, what a foreign concept. And he broke the bread and he gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And then he passed it amongst them, encouraging them to take it and, and to eat and to be a part of him forever. He then, as he was gathered with them, took the chalice of wine, lifting it to heaven and giving thanks to his Father, and he said, this is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin and the promise of life everlasting. Take it and drink in remembrance of me, and remember me as often as you drink from this cup. You see, Christ our Lord invites all to His table. All who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live a life in communion, in connection with Him. Illuminating the way for each of us to find that peace and that love and that power that exceeds all understanding. So as the ushers invite you to come forward from the back, um, Remember that that bread symbolizes His body. And that little cup of juice, His blood, which were given to us to be forever connected in Him. And if, 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 if you don't want to come forward, I will bring the, the cup and the, and the bread to you and just stay in your seats. But remember, this is not the invitation of a pastor, but the invitation of Christ our Lord to his heavenly banquet.